Hey everyone, this time on Modern Horror, Paranormal Activity goes retro. Now, when Paranormal Activity 2 was released in October of 2010, it broke box office records, becoming the biggest horror movie opening ever. Eventually grossing almost 60 times its budget, it is absolutely no surprise that Paramount jumped on another sequel like a hobo on a ham sandwich, and Paranormal Activity 3 was released one year later. As far as personnel, Chris Landon stayed on as writer, but Todd Williams was replaced by the directing team of Henry Joost and Ariel Schulman, hot off the success of their documentary Catfish. And I guess it makes a lot of sense to hire documentarians to direct a found footage movie since found footage movies are supposed to look real. Now, I don't know if it was the directors or the production team being in a really, really good groove, but I consider this movie to be the high point of the sequels. I really like it, and just in case there's any confusion, I am watching the extended cut available on the Blu-ray slash DVD release. So without further ado, Paranormal Activity 3. This time the series dispenses with the Paramount Would Like to Thank card, which sort of makes sense since for the first time the footage wasn't actually found at a crime scene, it's still unaccounted for having been stolen during the last movie. So this one jumps right into handicam footage of very pregnant Christy preparing a room for Baby Hunter about five months before Paranormal Activity 2. Katie arrives with a few boxes of Grandma Lois's things that she'd like to store in Christy's basement since she's moving in with Mika and doesn't actually have the space. Now, just to firmly establish the connection between the two, we drop in a bit of the break-in aftermath scene, but this time we add a line about the boxes being stolen. Now, with the setup out of the way, we travel back to 1988 and young Katie's eighth birthday party. Christy's imaginary friend Toby gets introduced right off the bat, and we also get introductions to Dennis and Grandma Lois through wedding video-style testimonials that he shoots at the party. I held you in my arms. And you made me laugh and cry at the same time. You're so cute. Here for a few months, um, but thank you for welcoming me into your family. Now, making Dennis a professional videographer is a really good way to explain him owning all this equipment without needing something super dramatic, like the home invasion from the last movie. Now, Dennis introduces us to his assistant, Randy, by means of an entry to America's Funniest Home Videos, which, of course, was the YouTube of 1988. Dude, it's a prank! Sometime later, he joins the family for Picture Day, where we get to see the creation of the photo that Dan will burn in two, that Mika will find in one. Dennis thinks he hears something, so he goes to investigate with his 1980s camcorder in tow. You know, just in case he needs to bludgeon a man to death. So while we wait for the movie to get started, I wanted to dissect the structure of the Paranormal Activity movies to this point. So the first movie tended to approach scenes as being either day or night, and cycle between them without a whole lot of variance. Something would happen at night, and then it would be the next day, and the characters would react to it. Wash, rinse, repeat. They'd include a few scenes here or there right before bed, but with the exception of the flaming Ouija board, none of them were too vital to the plot and were just there as kind of character beats, or to bookend longer gaps between nights. Paranormal Activity 2 used a lot more nuance by setting several different scenes over the span of a day. So something might happen really early in the morning, and then a character beat midday, leading to an afternoon conversation, then an evening activity outside, followed by a scare scene, and then a reaction to that later that night. Which made it, ugh, the whole thing feel like a much longer story instead of a series of isolated vignettes. This movie is much closer to the original scare-than-reaction approach than Paranormal Activity 2's more story-centric plotting, but with a bit less of this very strict binary feel. In the universe, I think this makes a lot of sense because Mika and Dennis are very similar, while Dan from 2 is kind of the odd one out in that he didn't place cameras to find ghostly activity, and then he doesn't spend any time at home reviewing those cameras. Out of universe, I think this also works because the series originally won an audience with tension and haunted house set pieces. So after 2 kind of cut down on those in favor of a family drama, this is a bit of a welcome return to form. Unfortunately, this also leads to the same problem I had when trying to outline the original's plot. So rather than try to deliver the same blow-by-blow -blow report, I'm going to save us all a lot of time and some pretty bad jokes by glossing over anything that's not plot important or standout creepy. 
So Dennis investigates the noise and doesn't find anything significantly out of place, except he does catch this door opening, and if you're more perceptive than I was the first dozen or so times I watched this movie, you'll notice that there's part of a handprint on the inside edge of the door that's oriented so that it's coming from inside the very small storage cubby. Oh. That night after putting the girls to bed, Julie rolls a fat joint containing the dankest purple headies known to the state of California to cause getting sublimely high. Because responsible adult meant something very different in the 80s. Or at least that's what I gather between this movie and Poltergeist. Dennis harkens backwards or forwards to Mika's desire to go extracurricular and convinces Julie to let him film them boinking. Extracurricular with this. You know, after that new gadget high fades, most technology pretty much gets used for either porn or cats. However, this probably wasn't the earth shattering he had in mind, and they have to run to make sure that the kids are okay until the earthquake is over. However, with the camera still running, we see some dust fall on the head and shoulders of an invisible peeping Tom, which is the first on-camera appearance of our demon. Now, when he sees that figure on the tape the next day, Dennis gets really interested, and after showing the invisible pervert to Julie and Randy, he sets up cameras in both bedrooms. Though I really do enjoy how he's showing Randy his failed sex tape and acting like, disregard booty, observe ghost. I'm not a sex tape? Yeah, I got this This weird thing <laughs> happened after... She really make a sex tape? Yeah, but it got into... I really appreciate the economy of the two-camera setup. Having the camera stationed where people are going to be talking anyway removes a lot of the need to go handheld, and the more typical camera angle helps us feel more connected Something. to the characters than the security cameras in PA2, which distance us and put us above them. Also, since there are only two, they can cut less and give us more time to scan the scene each night looking for what's going to happen. Now, getting into the first night, Toby comes out of the little closet and Christy comes over to dish. Yeah, probably. Hot Cloud, I can't hear you! Be quiet so we don't wake Katie up. Julie establishes herself as the non-believing prankster a la Dan during this daytime scene here, but when night falls, the girls are spending their night tent camping outside in the backyard, but that ends after Dennis investigates some noises and notices something that locked them out of the house. We're gonna move inside, okay? We'll stay here. Sometime during the next day, there's a conversation between Julie and Grandma Lois where Grandma Lois disses Dennis for being poor. Lois also tries to talk Julie into having another kid, hoping for a son this time, which really does become a lot more sinister as the series continues. Yes, that is. That's it. That night is pretty uninteresting, except as a setup to a scare later. But back in the daytime, Randy mentions the Bloody Mary game, and Katie quickly latches onto it as the best idea ever. After unpacking all their gear, he brainstorms an awesome new camera with Dennis. Presenting the Oscillocam, only two easy payments of 1995. By mounting a camcorder onto the body of an oscillating fan, Dennis has a camera that predictably scans between the kitchen and the living room front door area. The whole thing is an awesome gimmick because it covers two rooms with a single camera and lets them switch between those without a cut so they can have more, longer shots. There's also an interesting sense of tension around the impending reveal of each room because you know something is eventually coming, but you don't know when it'll happen or what it'll be. The next night and day sequences focus on Christy messing around with Toby, who's starting to sound like a bit of an abusive uncle. He told me not to talk about it. Bad touch. Down in the garage, Randy delivers a bunch of stolen library books to Dennis, who wanted to read up on the occult. Now, this doesn't really affect anything. I'm only mentioning it because not reusing the book that Mika read in the first movie seems like a bit of a missed opportunity. So while Dennis is getting himself learned something, Katie decides to follow up on her new Bloody Mary obsession by forcing Christy to play with her. But their mom interrupts them before anything can happen. Except the camera is left in the bathroom where Toby is clearly not a fan of Bloody Mary and slams the door after her one's left. This isn't the best scare in the movie, but I feel like it deserves some special mention because of how it uses a jump scare. Back in Sinister, I said the jump scares work best when the audience is given a fair hint to the scare, but this one kind of turns that on its head by giving us the hints and then misdirecting us. 
Basically what happens here is that we see Julie on the Asillo cam eating some leftovers, dumping them down the sink, and then having to reach into the disposal to clear something before a loud noise startles her. But instead of getting the nickname Stubbsy Featherston, she just needs to hire a contractor to go and fix that lamp that fell down. Dismemberment obviously would be a bit too far for a paranormal activity movie, so they just used the threat of it to build that tension and then released it by calling back to the swaying lamp from a few nights earlier. And if you think back on the lamp, it was getting brighter and brighter over this somewhat lengthy scene, so it was heavily hinted at. During a tea party the next day, the creepy uncle vibe from Toby gets turned way up. Oh. And he didn't like that. And then when Katie makes fun of Christy, Toby rages out and locks Katie in the car. Katie! Christy! What are you doing? But because they'll be damned if they're gonna let the terror of the children get in the way of their love life, Dennis and Julie go out on a date. Now, babysitting for the girls is all of 1980s fashion distilled into a single teenager. Meet Lisa. She mocks Dennis lightly using a sheet before retiring to the kitchen to do some homework during another awesome solo cam moment. Lisa's lame jump scare aside, there's nothing here until about a minute and a half into the shot when we see a small figure by the door wearing a sheet. Now this could just be one of the girls. By the time the camera pans back, it's gone and we have to wait a little bit for the reveal. Suddenly it's behind Lisa and then just as we start to pan off it again, the sheet falls to the ground as if there was never anything there. Now it's been two and a half minutes since the shot started, and it does keep going for a bit like we might get more, but Lisa just collects the sheet and dumps it in the master bedroom before going to check up on the girls. Now when she gets near the cubby, she gets hit in the face with a huge gust of wind and wigs out. This whole sequence is four minutes long with only a single cut, but has enough small little things that happen to keep it interesting. Lisa waits by the door until Julie and Dennis get home and then hot foots at the hell out of here, and the night caps off with Christy and Toby getting into some very late night hijinks. Like, you know, jumping from the second floor balcony and not breaking anyone's legs. Skipping the next day at night, Christy goes and does the stand and stare thing for like an hour and then just sort of wanders off and breaks up with Toby. Presumably after they had such a good time leaping from heights, Toby thought he could skip straight to the kill your parents stage or something else that's suitably demonic and Christy was having absolutely none of it. But I only bring it up because it's a turning point in the nature of Toby's activity. You see, he retaliates by making her sick or she comes down with something because she's shaking off his demonic influence or pure coincidence, I don't know, pick your, pick your theory. Either way, it ends with Dennis and Julie taking Christy to the hospital while Randy plays Bloody Mary in a possibly haunted house with an eight-year-old. Now he's seen Dennis's footage, he is fully aware of what's going on. So they try to summon Bloody Mary again, but Toby is apparently the kind of pimp that doesn't take too kindly to some uppity John trying to call hose to his pad uninvited and slices up Randy's nipple. Really pervy uncle. Toby continues its tantrum by shaking everything and then flipping over some toy furniture, which Randy sets back up and then packs all of his stuff and gets the hell out of Dodge as soon as Dennis comes back. Good job, Randy. Be smart. Be like Randy. While Dennis tries to show his evidence to Julie, Toby starts picking on Katie, first stopping her in her tracks and then lifting her off the ground by her ponytail. Now, something about this attack really disturbed me when I saw it in the theater. It's just something so simple and so threatening that Toby will haul you up by your hair and watch you squirm because your sister pissed him slash it off. And the execution of the effect is also quite good. I mean, found footage gets used a lot to avoid showing effects that you don't have the budget for, but in this case, it's right on camera with absolutely nothing hiding. Manipulate my hair. That night, overly touchy Toby continues tormenting Katie, say that five times fast, first by crawling into bed with her and then by pulling her into the little closet and keeping her there until Christy agrees to do something. I'll do it. Apparently this something is going to go visit Grandma Lois, which Julie completely denies, at least until Toby plays this kitchen trick on her. We've used some time-release glue to attach all of this homeowner's kitchen supplies to her ceiling. Let's see if she notices. 
Now this is apparently enough to justify the six and a half hour drive to grandmother's house where Lois ups the skeeviness by dressing Christy up for her wedding to Toby. And here's where the movie really kicks off its climax. A bunch of people show up at the house, which wakes Dennis up. How rude is that? He looks for Julie and finds a bunch of occult symbols which were previously hidden under all the paintings in the house. These have also been scattered throughout the movie up until this point, if you noticed. Now apparently Grandma is hosting the Canasta Club slash Witches Coven tonight, and they're planning a fuck some shit up social. The movie runs in pretty high gear as Dennis tries to gather Christy, Katie, and Julie and escape. He finds Julie hovering at the top of the stairs and something unseen hurls her down the stairs by her neck, so she's basically done. Dennis finds Christy and they try to hide in a closet. But when he jumps out to collect Katie, she is already possessed and throws him into the other room. Grandma shows up and this unseen force snaps Dennis in half backwards. Katie and Christy follow Grandma upstairs, presumably to be indoctrinated into the unholy coven with the evil and demonic Toby. And the movie cuts to static with the sound of demonic breathing on the camera. Now, Paranormal Activity 3 was a huge success commercially, and I think one of the best movies in the series besides the original. Just like with number two, this had to function on its own and expand the universe that it's set in. Since it's also a prequel, it needs to establish background for everything that we've seen before. Now, Paranormal Activity 2, I think, succeeded in the task of universe building, but it fell a bit flat on being its own movie due to its pacing problems and some poor camera placement. I mean, the whole premise of Paranormal Activity is things going bump in the night but people generally spend their nights sleeping in their beds, and since they couldn't justify security cameras in the bedrooms, they had to have bumps in the mid-afternoon and late evening, which just isn't nearly as dramatic. Now, on its own, Paranormal Activity 3 is pretty well paced and had some really good scares, and the justifications for all the cameras made sense, and even adding the third camera mid-story had good on-screen motivation. They really used the static cameras they had as much as they could, and I love the Oscillocam gimmick, though I do wish they'd gotten to use it a bit more, since it opens up a lot more creative possibilities than yet another camera in the corner of the bedroom. But again, in universe, it makes sense to not start out with it, since it's a bit of a crazy move to go for right off the bat. The escalation of the demonic powers was really good too. I mean, it both builds at a sensible rate and hits a nice and satisfying pitch. It's not nearly as grounded as the activity in the first movie was, but it doesn't go completely hog wild either. It's just amped up enough to be a good sequel. And I think they hit gold with the Dennis character, finally getting the balance that Mika and Dan just couldn't manage where he was a bro, and he was confident, but he wasn't a total tool. And what's, what's really interesting is that they actually managed to characterize the Toby demon way beyond demon want baby, like we had in the last movie. Toby treats Christy and Katie differently and actually goes from interacting very playfully with Christy to being very, very dangerous and threatening when she stops going along with the plan. Now this entry was a huge moneymaker, smashing the last movie's opening easily and even going on to outgross the original movie. And so given that the series was basically a money printing machine at this point, Paranormal Activity 4 was a shoe in for next October, and that's when things started getting weird. But that's for later. In the meantime, thank you very much for checking out some modern horror. Feel free to leave any comments or questions you have below, or subscribe for uh, more videos, follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Cheers, folks, and uh, happy 2016 from Modern Horror.